take a test in March that will test the May of the week. Twenty page paper if I'm doing my work. That's it. Yeah, you can really slack off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, I'm trying to answer questions in the next chapter or something like that. Like a one page yeah, at least like once a week, yeah. Ten spheres or something. I've never done 20 years before. Yeah, I've never done it. Most of them, it's like 12, and I barely like 50. No. I was like, I think we have too, too hard to do because it's for uh, information security. Oh, so much okay. patents. The fact that you're sitting there so <laughs> the proofreading the whole entire thing. How do you do that? It's just you can't do it at the last minute and say, okay, 20 pages now. That's the hard part. Good morning. How are you all? There's noticeably less of you on Friday than uh, than there were on Monday and Wednesday. Um, so today I wanted to talk about your professional development plans a little bit more and um, why I, I, I wanted to have you do them in the first place. So, you know, my, like I said about the value proposition of, of Cal State, like, I think, I think you should get a diploma, skill, skills and abilities, and a job uh, when you leave this place. That should be what we deliver to you guys. So, to that end, on the third point, I, I want to know for each of you, basically, what are you doing today? And what do you want to be doing after you graduate? Um, and related to that, I'm going to talk about a little bit more today is how much money do you make today and how much money are you going to need to make to achieve your goals in life? And um, <coughs> depending on what your goals are, depending on what your goals are, your salary that you make when, uh, when you first get out of Cal State is probably not going to be enough to reach all the goals that you have in life. So it's, it's important to know how much money you're going to need and plan accordingly in your, your career path. Um, 
And that basically consists of a baseline, and that's what you're doing right now. Um, Mid-range goals or what you're going to be doing after you graduate, and long-term goals or where you want to be 10, 20 years from now. And um, <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about uh, the rule of 10 as well. I, I, I think I've mentioned it before, but um, as, a, as a former salesperson, I, I did a lot of sales over the course of my, my career. And if you want anything to work out, if you want to get the job you want, you need at least 10 applications out there. Um, if you want a new customer, you need at least 10 potential customers that you're talking to. So um, that plays into this whole thing as well. Um, so the professional development plan, you've got the baseline that you told me already. Um, the mid-range goals, what, I'm, what I was looking for in, in what you put together for me was really brainstorming next steps for your professional life. Um, setting some realistic income goals for your budget or based on what your budget is right now and where you need to get to. And um, based on those first two things, um, setting up the proper job search and, uh, and network building. Um, for your long-term goals, how many people in here don't really know what you want to be when you grow up, as it were? <laughs> Yeah, what color is your parachute? How many people have heard of this book? Um, it's a great book. Um, you can get it on Amazon for about five bucks or so. Um, it gives you a whole bunch of exercises to do about the, the things that you enjoy doing in life. So how do you like to interact with people? How do you like to interact with things? How do you like to use information? How do you like to talk? How do you like to listen? How do you like to learn? Um, it asks you all kinds of questions like this and then basically gives you some suggestions on what, uh, what would be a fulfilling career for you. And um, when, I filled out this, when I filled out the exercises in this book, what, 20, it's scary to talk about. This is 2017 now. So 24 years ago, when I filled out these exercises after I graduated from Stanford, um, it said I should be a college professor. And I didn't listen. I didn't listen. I wanted to build my own business. I wanted to be big, big, big. Uh, not that this is not a big job, but I, I wanted to go out there into the world and not stay in academia. And um, I've never been happier in a job than I am in the one that I have right now. So this book, this book is really good for telling you what, uh, what you're going to be happy doing in life. So any of you who have any questions whatsoever about what's going to make you happy as a career, I highly recommend getting this book. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, planning the income that you need. I want you to all I want you all to dream big. If you want to be a millionaire, say it. You want to be a millionaire. Let's plan to get you there. If you want to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, let's plan the steps to get you there. Um, that's going to involve both planning and some general network building. So one of the things I, I always invite my students to do is to take a look at all my contacts in LinkedIn and pick one that you'd like to be introduced to. And I will introduce you to that contact. It'll whatever, whoever you think is going to help you with your, your dreams long term, or even who's going to help you with your networking for, for job search short term, um, pick one and I will introduce them to you or you, you to them both. So this is the template, what it looks like. You guys are all familiar with it because I sent it to you on email. Um, some, there's some pretty standard things that you could put in your, your midterm goals for your, uh, what you want to do after graduation. It could be that you want to earn more money in your current job. Maybe you've already got a good job and you just want to, to continue with that job and, uh, and, and make more money because you've now got your degree. That's, that's a valid goal. Um, and if that's your goal, um, I will help you, I will help you craft your professional image so that you are the most appealing possible to get paid more. Um, if what you'd like to do is stay in the same company, but move up to a higher position, maybe you're uh, entry level right now and you'd like to move up to a management role or some kind of, of higher responsibility. Um, 
that's that's also a valid goal and, and something that a lot of people do coming out of undergrad. Um, a third thing is finding a new job in the same industry. So maybe you're already doing uh, data entry in the agriculture sector, but what you'd really like to be doing is uh, is is personnel management. So uh, you know maybe maybe to do that, you move out of your current company and you move into a new one. You're in the same industry, but you've moved up to a different job in a new company. Um, you could also switch to a different industry. Maybe right now you're in food service or, or hospitality, and what you'd really like to be in is, is the oil sector. Um, when you graduate from undergrad, it's a perfect opportunity to switch industries. So that's another valid, valid goal. Uh, grad school is also a valid goal. If, uh, if any of you are thinking about doing an MBA or another kind of master's or, or PhD eventually, then Maybe your goal is to apply to grad schools and go right from your undergrad into a grad school program. That's that's also a valid valid goal. And I want to talk a little bit about internships, volunteer opportunities, and hobby projects. Um, don't turn your nose up at these things. It's, it's it's tempting to do, especially when you're all seniors and um, and you're graduating. You need to find a job that pays well. Um, don't forget about things that don't pay. Um, and, and a story for you about that. When I was doing my MBA at UCLA, between the first and the second years, everybody got a job over the summer between the first and second years of the program. And a lot of my friends, they went to Wall Street and they were making bank and really good money. They're rubbing shoulders with like Gordon Gecko and, uh, I was envious of, of what they're doing. And I, I, I was, I wanted to get in the music business. So um, I was working at a company called Artist Direct, which was an online, online uh, merchandise store for artists. And it was also uh, a concert booking agency. And I worked in the internet side of it and I got paid five bucks an hour. And I was, I was miserable all summer because I was only getting paid five bucks an hour. Um, but they stuck me where they did because I, I insisted on getting paid. If I had been willing to work for free, if I had been willing to just get coffee and make copies and answer phone calls for the agents, um, I probably, not that I don't wanna be sitting here right now because I love the job that I do, but in terms of career opportunities, I probably would be on the, the Hollywood top 100 power brokers chart right now because the, the people that I had the chance to work with, it really would have got me into the door with some really big acts and some really big, big stuff. That, uh, that agency, the, the guys that founded that company were the founders of Lollapalooza. And um, the agency they had, um, some of the acts were the Red Hot Chili Peppers, um, Beastie Boys, um, Robbie Williams, um, Slayer, Soul Coughing, Marilyn Manson. I mean, they, they were major acts and I could have gotten to know the people that worked uh, behind the scenes for those acts if I had just been willing to work for free. So even if you, you do something part-time on the weekends or whatever, um, don't, don't poo-poo things that you do for free because they can really help you get your foot in the door with the stuff that you love. And, uh, and long-term, you're going to be glad that you did it. So even if you have to do it part-time because you got to find some job to pay the bills, don't uh, don't turn your nose up at internships or volunteer opportunities or even doing something as a hobby in your spare time because uh, if you're willing to work for free, and you can you can really get your door, your foot in the door in a lot of things. Um, I want to, I, I have a list here of, standard things that should be in every one of your budgets. Now, a lot of you, a lot of you have artificially low budgets while you're undergrad because you're living at home or you're getting support from your spouse or your, 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 your costs are not what they would be if you weren't a student full time. Um, so it's important to me in, in this class that you guys think about what what your expenses are going to have to be when you're out of here and you're, you're, you're working in a real job and, and responsible for, for the full costs of being an adult. Uh, first of all, taxes and withholdings. 
So um, it's it's really easy to think, okay, well, if I have a if I have a fifty thousand dollar a year job, that means basically five thousand dollars a month. Well, no, it doesn't mean five thousand dollars a month. It means more like thirty five hundred dollars a month after taxes and withholding. So the first thing you got to remember is that whatever your salary is, take off about 15, 20%. And that's what's actually going to be your take home. Maybe even take off 25%. Um, so first of all, whatever the salary is, when you're thinking about what money is going to be available to you, think about that. Um, second of all, um, you really should be saving about 20% of your income. Um, this is something that I did not do very well earlier in life. And I'm really lucky that there's a good pension program here at Cal State because otherwise I'd be screwed for my old age. Um, my dad, uh, who I'm taking care of right now, um, did not plan well for his, uh, his old age. And I got to tell you, it's a nightmare when you get old if you don't have enough money. Uh, it's an absolute nightmare. Um, so save. <laughs> save for your long-term retirement, save for old age, uh, and save about 20% if you can. Um, it's also important to have rainy day funds. Um, and by that, I mean your 20% your savings for your retirement, you can put that into long-term vehicles, which, uh, which bring a good interest return, uh, but you can't access the money. If you need the money tomorrow for some emergency, you can't get to it without paying a penalty. Uh, rainy day fund, just in a savings account or in a money market account. Um, important to have in case something goes wrong, in case you have health problems, in case you lose your job. Um, I, like to, I like to put it in terms of Star Wars. Um, you never know when your rebel cruiser is going to be overtaken by an Imperial Star Destroyer and you need to jettison the plans with the droids. So make sure that you have escape pods because <laughs> otherwise, the empire is going to get the plants. Um, so um, rainy day funds, it's important to have at least a couple thousand. Ideally, ideally you want 12 to 18 months of burn rate. So whatever your monthly expenses are, um, you want to have 12 to 18 months of, of that in cash available in case you lose your job or you have health problems. Um, so those are two savings items that you really should be thinking about. In addition to that, the, the normal cast of characters, health care, rent and utilities, car payments, telecom, which I kind of I kind of throw phone, Internet, TV, online subscriptions. I throw that all under telecom in my mind uh, and then food and entertainment. And very importantly, question mark, like everybody in here has your own passions, your own your own interests in life that are going to cost money. And that's where the question mark comes in here. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how between the midterm and the long term, I want you to expand your planning for that question mark. So how many in here, how many people in here are familiar with runner link? I'm glad to hear that. Like I, I, I told the other class this as well a year or two ago. If I asked that same question, I'd see two or three hands, and that was it. I'm glad that the university is doing a better job of, of getting the word out about RunnerLink. Um, just FYI, in case you're not too familiar with using it, um, I'm going to pull up a couple things that I wanted to point out with RunnerLink right now. I'm going to try anyway.
Okay, so this is kind of the 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 home screen of uh, of of RunnerLink, and there's two things that I want to point your attention towards: employer directory and job search. Um, if you just click on employer directory here, you know you can you can search for employers in different areas, but if you just click search without a state or an industry. Uh, it will give you the list of all all employers that we have uh, contact with in our career center. And you'll notice there's, you can't see it very well on the screen, but there's 1,893 employers that we, uh, we maintain contact with in our career center. Um, if you find any of these employer names that are interesting to you, you can just contact the Career Center and ask them who is the HR contact point or who is the hiring contact point at this organization. So even if they don't have a position they're currently hiring for, you can leverage the network that we have at, uh, at Cal State to, to, to find contacts at these organizations. So um, 1,893 employers is, uh, is not insignificant. Um, I also want to point you towards the job search. If you do the same thing on job search, rather than looking for a particular industry or position type, if you just click search, it'll show you all of the jobs that we're currently hiring for at the, the, the Career Center. And you can see there's 296 jobs that are currently being recruited for here on this campus. So um, depending on what your career interests are, what job you're looking for, um, there's a lot of things. Our career center is not the best in the world, and it's easy to sort of uh, dismiss what they might be able to offer you. But I'd like to like to encourage you to, to use their resources because there are 296 jobs um, out there currently that people are looking to hire for out of this campus. So good, good, um, good opportunity there. Moving back to the presentation again. In addition to RunnerLink, um, social media uh, is a great place to find job offerings. Um, Monster and other job boards are great. Usually, if you post, if you apply for a job via Monster or via social media, um, you want to identify a specific network building target after that. So send in your application, do all the homework, dot the I's, cross the T's like you're supposed to, and then find a contact at that company, contact them and say, hey, I applied for this position. Do you know who the hiring manager is? Can you make sure that they see my resume? Um, that's a lot more effective than just applying for the position without uh, contacting anyone. So. Uh, another thing, I just opened the presentation again, but I'm going to close the presentation. I'm going to get out of the presentation and go to LinkedIn again because there's something, something that I did not show you guys last time that I want to show you. And hopefully it'll remember me this time since I logged in from here last time. Let's see. Yep, cool. So, somebody tell me the name of a company you'd like to work for. Wonderful. Wonderful. I'm going to put wonderful company. Uh, they are, but let's see what we get out of Wonderful Company first. So, this is this. These are all the search results here. If you look at the top, you've got people, jobs, companies, groups, and schools. If you click on the jobs tab, you'll notice the Wonderful Company. This is the one we're talking about. All of these, maintenance and reliability director, IT services technician, office assistant, associate counsel, these are all positions that Wonderful is currently hiring for. So 
if uh, if you're interested in, in looking for jobs at a certain company, LinkedIn is great for this. And if you notice, um, 363 results. So there's 363 jobs that are being recruited for uh, actively at Wonderful Company right now. So um, LinkedIn is a great way to see what what uh, various companies are hiring for. So um, all you got to do is type in the name of the company and then go to the jobs tab and it'll show you all the, uh, the listings for jobs that that company is hiring for. So another good, another good way to, uh, to, to build your job search. Um, what color is your parachute? That, that uh, book that I talked about before, these are some examples of, uh, of how I filled the book out back uh, in, in the day by hand. Um, I've also given you a link here that'll take you to the Amazon place where you can buy that book. Um, this is the 2016 edition. There may be a 2017 edition out now. There is. Have you seen? I was looking. Okay, at cool. About yeah, it. it's it's a great book. So uh, I put a link in here for you, but it's not hard. If you just type in what color is your parachute on Amazon, it'll bring it right up. Okay, a little more than five, but it's not <laughs> not expensive. Um, but the book doesn't change much every year. So if you bought the 2016 edition or the 2015 edition, I bet you can get it for even less. Um, okay, so I think there's three more slides that I wanted to go through and we'll actually be done for Friday. Um, plant, yes. Sometimes, um, sometimes if you're looking for uh, entry level or low level stuff, uh, it's not listed on LinkedIn as well as it is on uh, Monster and Um the, the higher level stuff is really good. So you guys are right on the cusp right now of, of the kinds of jobs that are being recruited for on LinkedIn. But um, I think they're both good. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. I wanted to talk a little bit about expanding the question mark section of your budget. So the, 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 the exercise of planning, planning how much money you're going to need to achieve your dreams in life. And I've got a couple of examples here. Um, I really, I, I, over the course of my life, this is the 13th city that I've lived in in my life. And, um, I, I've, I've lived on the East Coast, I've lived on the West Coast, I've lived in the Midwest, I've lived in Germany, I've lived in Brazil. Um, so I have friends and family all over the world that I miss and I like to go visit. So for me, um, having a large travel budget and entertainment budget is, is something that I've always wanted in my life because no matter where I am, most of my family or friends are not there. So... Um, I, I sat down several years ago and I actually counted up how much money would I need in order to be able to truly visit everybody or pay for them to come here if I can't get off work. Um, and it came out to about $30,000. So if I had $30,000 set aside for my friends and family each year, um, that, would, that would pretty much be su su sufficient to see everybody I could possibly see. I might have to swap out who I visit which year sometimes because there's only so many there's only so many days in the year that I can visit. But I really sat down and counted up. Okay, how much is a flight to Brazil normally? Yeah, it's about a thousand bucks. Um, how much money am I going to spend while I'm there? Well, I've got a little bit of hotel costs. Sometimes I can stay with friends, but I'm probably going to have a little bit of hotel costs. I'm going to have food and entertainment. Um, 
I sat down and really calculated how much do I need. And when I came up with 30,000, I was like, oh my God, I'm screwed. There's no way, there's no way I can do this. But um, I think right now I'm spending about 10 to 15 a year on, uh, well, no, let me take, let me think about it. Um, I'm spending 10,000 just on entertainment. So I'm probably at 15 to 20 for, for travel and entertainment. Uh, it's not quite where I'd like to be, but uh, I, I planned in my budget and I planned on the salary that I got on this, this job here at Cal State so that I could actually afford to do those things. And it may take you five or 10 years to get there, but if you don't know, if you don't sit down and calculate how much it's going to cost to do what you want to do, you're never going to achieve it. So I, I highly encourage you to sit down and just add up the numbers for whatever it is that you want to achieve. And don't be afraid if the numbers are really big and scary because you got to know what they are first in order to be able to attack the problem. So a couple other things that I wanted to give an example of. Um, Buying a house, taking care of your parents, being a millionaire, and owning a Learjet. Those are like, those are all goals that I've thought about at one time or another in my life. So um, I, I listed them in order of in order of increasing difficulty. So um, buying a house, um, you know, normal housing prices here in Bakersfield are around two hundred thousand. Sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more, but if you think about 200000 as the average and you think about the fact that you're going to need a 20% down payment, you need, you need 40000 bucks in order to buy a house. So that may seem daunting, but if you save 400 bucks a month for 10 years, that's $40,000. If you save 1000 bucks a month for four years, that's $40,000. It's actually a little bit less. It's a little bit less time. It's a little bit more than $40,000. So it's not impossible if you plan ahead. Um, uh, taking care of your parents. Uh, I'm, I'm familiar with this firsthand now. Um, decent. If your parents do not plan for their own long term. Uh, I, I, I highly recommend, by the way, if your parents do not have long term care insurance and they're not sick yet, think about long-term care insurance. Because um, the, the cost of a, of a long-term care facility is between three and four grand a month for a decent facility. Um, that's, you know, you can do the math, that's 40 to $50,000. That's thirty to $45,000 a year for, uh, for, for taking care of your parents when they, they really do get sick and uh, and, and need to be in a facility. Um, it's a lot of money. But if you plan ahead, um, <clears throat> certainly getting long-term care insurance in the first place is, is a great, you know, you can, you can get long-term, I, I could get long-term, I don't have it for myself right now, I really should, but uh, I was too busy dealing with stuff for my dad to also pull the trigger on that. But, I could get long-term care insurance for about 180 bucks a month right now. Like if I paid 180 bucks a month now, um, I would have about $750,000 worth of long-term care insurance. Um, even if you don't pay for the insurance, just setting aside money each month, um, not to be morbid, but once your parents get to a long-term care facility stage, uh, they're probably not going to live forever. So if you stockpile, if you stockpile uh, $30,000, that'll pay for a year's worth of their, their, uh, their stay at a long-term care facility. Um, and, you know, stockpiling more will, will uh, do so accordingly. And if your parents are relatively young right now, then you, if you start planning now, then you can save up enough money or you can get them onto long-term care insurance so that when, uh, when the time does come, you're prepared. Um, being a millionaire... Um, actually, if your parents were going to be in long-term care indefinitely, it's almost as easy to save for their, like you have to, you have to save to be a millionaire in order to keep them in long-term care indefinitely. Um, so.
So you know, I talked about it being thirty to forty-five thousand dollars a year to pay for long-term care. Um, it's actually um, if you save between twenty and thirty thousand dollars a year for about twenty to thirty years, um, you'll be a millionaire if you invest the money relatively well. Um, it's 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 it may sound like a lot, but twenty thousand dollars a year is two thousand dollars a month. Um, if I actually changed around my budget right now and, and what were my priorities, I could save two thousand a month. It's it's not that hard. Um, it's hard when you first get out of, of, of undergrad, but if you plan on getting into a six figure income, 100, 150,000, 200,000 eventually, um, it's not that hard to save 2000 bucks a month. And 20, believe me, 20 years goes by faster than you think. So, uh, it won't take that long until you get there. Um, finally, uh, I, I put owning a Learjet up here because I, I travel a lot and I hate having to go through like uh, security and sitting around and being stuffed into an airplane like a sardine. Um, like it would be really cool if I had my own jet. Um, what, how many, who, who, did anybody in here know how much the Learjet costs? No. Huh? It's more. Um, well, there's, there's two figures I have, um, uh, like beautiful Gulf stream type, um, Learjet. It's about 60 million. Um, if you want to rent a timeshare on that. So there's a, there's a company called, anybody heard of NetJets? There's a company that rents timeshares on, on Learjets. It's called NetJets. And, um, <clears throat> I believe, if I remember the numbers correctly, you need five hundred thousand dollars just to get in, um, and then it's like one hundred twenty-five thousand a year. So if you add that up, five hundred thousand plus four years of one hundred twenty-five thousand is already a million dollars. But uh, it's you can you can rent the timeshare a lot cheaper than buying the entire jet, but. Those I I just I didn't know I didn't used to know what those numbers were and and uh, in order it, it actually as an example for this class I thought well if I'm want to practice what I preach I should sit down and like go to the internet and find out what it costs to buy a jet um, so uh, I encourage all of you to do this research for whatever your your dreams are I mean it's it it may seem daunting it may seem like uh, kind of a a, a, a like hopeless task, but it's not hopeless. If you, you can't plan, you can't plan ahead and do the steps necessary to get where you want to go unless you know uh, what the money is that it's going to take. So I highly encourage you to research whatever it is that your dreams are and then make them come true. Um, <clears throat> general network building. I'm going to skip past this one. Just basically, um, the, the point that I wanted to make on general men, on general network building is uh, that, first of all, there's a lot of people out there who, uh, there's always people out there to, uh, uh, to, to connect with. The, the, the question you have to ask yourself is, uh, what's in it for them? Um, and it usually... It's not what you think. You know, I have a lot of guests. You guys later on will benefit from this. I have guest speakers come in and talk to this class either in person or via Skype uh, every semester. And I don't pay them for that. Um, they don't, they, their businesses usually do not benefit from that in any way. Sometimes they, they uh, there's a couple of uh, speakers who like to recruit students from here to work for their companies. So they get something out of talking here. But in general, they don't get anything out of talking except that they do their jobs all day and nobody ever tells them they did a good job. And it's, it's nice to be appreciated. So uh, having the chance to give advice to students is something that a lot of people like to take the time to do because it makes them feel good about themselves. So um, think about what's in it for the other person. And it may just be 
it may just be that you have to say thank you, you know, um, but but re think about things from their perspective and realize that uh, they're busy people. Um, and then building and maintaining a mentor relationship. Um, kind of the same as what I was saying here, just realize that uh realize that people's time and uh and and people's time is valuable and um uh make sure to a thank them for it and b um do your homework beforehand to 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 ask people good questions when you are talking with them um the last thing about uh network building and the the, the rule of 10 that i believe in so heavily um you know, there's like over 7 billion people on the planet. There's always, like I said before, going to be somebody out there who wants what you have to offer, or there's always somebody who's, who can help you. The challenge is just weathering the process of how to find them. Um, you need to recognize and accept that you'll probably need to reach out to 10. You probably need to send 10 messages on LinkedIn in order to get one response. Now, that'll be different when I introduce you to people, but... If you're if you're truly reaching out to strangers, you're probably going to have to reach out to ten strangers in order to find one that responds to you, and you're probably going to need ten people who respond to you to truly find somebody who's going to get you a job or who's going to be a mentor for for years uh, uh, along in your life. So, if you do the math, that's a hundred messages sent out to people. If, I, I guarantee you, though, if you send out a hundred messages to people. Just friendly, hey, you know, I, I saw your profile here. I'm a student at Cal State. I'm, or, you know, if you do this next year, hey, I saw your, your, your uh, profile. I'm, uh, I'm just starting my career in the banking industry. You seem like you'd be a great advice contact. Uh, can we talk sometime? If you send out, no, no, no like, slimy sales job. I, I, it hurts me to say that because I'm a former salesperson, but no, no, you know, just be honest. I'm, this is who I am. I really would like your advice and I'd like to talk for a coffee or something sometime. If you send out a hundred of those, I guarantee you, I guarantee you something really good will happen for you. Um, it might not even take a hundred, but um, I say a hundred just because it usually takes 10 just to have one person respond back to you. And of those people that respond back to you, you need 10 of those in order for one of them to really turn out to be a long-term contact for you. Um, but it works if you, if you try it. Um, leverage social media, uh, association member lists, all the databases that we have access to in our library uh, and Google to get public in, publicly, available for, uh, publicly available information. Um, questions like, how many people work at your company? Or how much money does your company make a year? Or what what are the main tasks, what are the main products that you, 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 you sell? Maybe 20 or 30 years ago, those would be valid questions because there's no way to find that information otherwise, but you don't need to waste valuable time with your contacts asking those kind of questions because you can find that out just by looking on the internet. Uh, for, for almost, and even small private companies, you can at least find out how many people work there and what approximately their revenues are. Um, you can find that out for any company. Uh, you can go to their website and find out what their products are. What their, you can find out a lot before you ever pick up the phone or before, before you ever sit down for a coffee. So make sure that you do your homework online beforehand. Um, document everything. No piece of information is too small. Um, and I, I have a, a story that I like to like to like, show or express for this. Um, one of the companies that I started back before I was a professor was a company called uh, Market Driver Consulting. Um, and we did we did sales work for other people. So. A lot of people don't like to pick up the phone and call strangers, so we would call strangers for them, and we would charge them an upfront fee in exchange for a certain number of people who we had talked to and agreed to talk to them. Um, so some of my clients were interested in getting a contact at a big PR firm in Indianapolis called, um, um, 
Oh, hang on. Borshoff Johnson. Um, and so I, I looked on the internet and I found the number for Eric Johnson, one of the two partners, and I called and the, the, the attendant said, no, you know, he's on vacation right now. Can I give you his voicemail? And I said, yeah, sure. Uh, so they sent me to his voicemail and the voicemail says, hey, this is Eric Johnson. I'm on vacation for two weeks. Uh, I'll try and get back to you as soon as I can when I get back. So I left a voicemail saying, hey, Eric, this is who I am, and this is what I do. Um, would love to talk to you sometime. And I made a note to myself that Eric is on vacation for two weeks. And so not going to do me any good to call tomorrow because he's on vacation for two weeks. Um, so I waited two weeks, and then I called. And, um, and I asked, like, hey, Eric, how was your vacation? Um, and... We started chatting a little bit, and we talked a little bit more, and he actually is a guest lecturer for many of my classes now. Um, I, at least once a year, I have him guest lecture in my classes. Um, and I didn't know him from a hole in the wall. The only way that we got to know each other was because I made sure to make a note of the fact that he was on vacation when I called him out of the blue. So it may seem hopeless or, or like little busy work, but... Nothing is too small. Document everything when you're when you're networking, and then finally, don't take rejection personally. It's just a part of the process. Um, whenever whenever you reach out and try and whenever you try and do something new, you're going to hear no more than you hear yes. Um, sort of like baseball. Even the best baseball players swing like they strike out or or or, or fly out more than they get on base. Um, so. Just realize the fact that you're going to strike out sometimes, and that's that's okay. It's not a comment on you personally. It's just the way the process works. Um, that's it for today. It's exactly ten till. So I thought we I thought it would take a little bit less time, but it didn't. Uh, have a great weekend, and I'll see you guys on Monday. Um, when do we have to have our LinkedIn profile spot? ASAP. Okay. Whenever. Hey, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, actually, yeah. Uh, Yes, yes. I remember. My friend is the VIP section. Uh huh. If you have any any game that's coming, can you invite me? I can buy a ticket. Oh yeah, you can buy a ticket. I'm not I'm not doing any other games, but.